Welcome to the Adam Savage Project. I'm Adam. I'm Norm. And I'm Roman Mars. Roman Mars. It's so good <laughs> to see you, my friend. It's good to see you, too. Thanks so much for having me here. Now, I happen to be on the road. Are you speaking to us from beautiful downtown Oakland, California? I, I'm not. Uh, the office is basically closed. Like It's big enough for two people to operate in there with while well, keeping you know COVID distances. And so I'm in my home in Berkeley, California. Okay. So I'm in... So I'm in Berkeley right now. <laughs> Still beautiful, although I think in the day of recording this, uh, pretty bad air quality. Uh, yeah. In, in, in the Bay Area, it's probably one, one of the worst days. You're, you're missing that, Adam, right now. Is it really? Yeah. It snuck up on us because yesterday it felt pretty good. The last couple of days it felt pretty good. And today it's like hazy and warm and, and unpleasant. And, I, and I've sort of gotten so used to being on alert that when, I, when the rubber band relaxed a couple of days ago, I, I wasn't prepared for it to go yeah. back into coiled state, you know, but it really is. It's like, it's wear your mask time again. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, I pulled I pulled into Denver yesterday and uh, made a left off of 80 to start heading south towards Denver. And immediately as I was facing Denver, I could tell there were fires because now my eye is sensitized to the yeah. difference between fire smoke and regular clouds. For sure. For sure. Strange times. Uh, well, it's great to see you and hear you. And it's been a while since we've reconnected. Uh, for mm. And we were terrible about this because we assume people know who you are, but <laughs> people may recognize <laughs> your voice. Uh, Roman, you're, of course, the uh, creator and host of 99% Invisible, one of our favorite podcasts. And uh, long running, you guys have been going on for, what, 10 years now? It's uh, 10 years last month. So it's, wow. it's right there. Yeah. Something Congratulations. Else. I'm, I'm it, shocked by it for sure. <laughs> yeah, it really it, is it's amazing <laughs> for lots of reasons. <laughs> I have to tell you, it has been 99PI has been one of, and I, I wrote you this during I know, early on did. in the lockdown. So it's sweet. been one of my safe spaces this whole, this whole last uh, six months. Um, I can take politics in small batches and I have my limits. And when I when I need that breath of fresh air, which I need almost every day, I dive right in and said, thank you for making such a, a, a lovely show that peels the onion in exactly the way I love peeling them. Oh, thank you so much. That means the world to me. Thank you. Dude, Who Let the Dogs Out is like just <laughs> one of my favorite hours of podcast ever. <laughs> yep. That was an absurd deep dive. Uh, yeah. Ben really led us on a journey on that one of trying to figure out who let the dogs out. And I mean, that's the breadth of the show. I mean, the funny thing is, is like sometimes we feel like, you know, we feel the world like so we had a bunch of sort of COVID stuff. We had a bunch of stuff, you know, related to Trump when Trump got elected originally but we always kind of do it through a, a certain lens that I don't feel is too oppressive. It's it like examines it. Like we we're still people in the world who react to the world. So we, we react to coronavirus. We react to our fears of politics and how we want to change things. But we still kind of present it in a world of like, okay, so the, what is the design of this? How do we look at it differently? How is the world the way it is? How did we get to here? And I still think it feels pretty hopeful in the end, even though some of the, sometimes the stakes are a little bit higher than uh, who wrote who let the dogs out. <laughs> but, but <laughs> actually, but, I mean, that was the that was the loveliest thing about it was there was just no bottom. It, it there was, was no those, bottom. It, it just like, kept going. It, it's like that fract. It's a fractal story. <laughs> it it was it just kept going, and that was so. It, it I was uh, that tickled me to no end because we did that one. We don't always do it such that. Um, that one, we kind of saved little pieces of it for me so that I would be ready in the studio to like react to uh. each step of the way. So when he says something like a lot of times, you know, I, I'm there and all that stuff, but we actually, Chris Berube, who helped produce it and, and adapt uh, Ben Sisto's uh, piece that he did like as a live stand up piece, um, we, we, uh, we saved some of it so that when I would hurt, I would, I would hear it for the first time. And so when it gets to the point where there's a, there's an eighties chant at a football game in Georgia in like 1983, and it sounds like who lets the dogs out. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And it was sort of delightful to figure that, it, you know, to save some of that for me. <laughs> we, there, there needs to be a word, and there probably is one in German, but there, there, <laughs> this was exactly a producing technique we used on Mythbusters. We knew, we knew what parts of a build we had to engage with, and anything we didn't, we would not even think about it until the moment it was in front of us on camera, yeah. just so that the audience would get exactly that. They would get that genuine reaction. 
it's pretty rare for us. I mean, cause you know, cause I'm still like, I'm involved in the edits and stuff of like course. this, but we kind of knew the, the structure of this enough and we knew to save it, you know, like, so, yeah. so this was an anomaly, but like, but because we knew that the journey that I was going on was the proxy for the, for the audience, which usually I'm kind of the steady hand who knows everything, right. even though, right. you know, I, I knew it about 20 minutes before you knew it. Um, but, but that's, <laughs> But that's the, you know, that's the magic of, of creating things. But, um, but yeah, that one was particularly fun because I didn't know all the stuff. Now, we are talking today uh, partially because 99PI is about to flex its muscles out of its current form and into <laughs> a paper form. You have written, you have co-written a book. Um, y- yeah. Tell us, tell us about this and what's going on. So Kurt Colstead and I, he's the digital director of 99PI, and he's often on the show with me talking about things because he's probably the 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 employee. Like, a he has an actual degree in architecture, which is unlike the rest <laughs> of us, and and he um, he he's just like a natural like study of this stuff. <laughs> we um, we co- co-authored this book called The 99% Invisible City: uh, The Field Guide to the Hidden World of Everyday Design, and it's. It's kind of has a sort of it has some of the look and feel and in, in, in sort of the idea and the semiotics of a field guide, but really is a collection of stories of um, everyday things that we find interesting. It's always the most interesting story we can find about a particular thing. So it's not always like the origin story of the traffic light. It's like the most interesting traffic light that we know of in the in the country. And and so it'll be things like that. So it's a it's a little field guide to to every city, much in the spirit of of 99 pi where the whole point is to notice the everyday and, and kind of wonder in it and and, and think I, about I, how we got to where we are uh early on this year like in january or something i was walking i was walking up valencia street to get my morning coffee and i passed uh that stand of all those electric bicycles you know that are mm-hmm. all over the, all over all the cities in the bay area and there was like 40 electric bicycles all in a row. And because it was seven in the morning, none of them had been taken. And I noticed all their seats. And I went to the end and I took carefully took this picture looking down all the seats <laughs> because I realized it was a somewhat self-selected demonstration of the leg length Various of your heights. average mission resident. <laughs> and I thought, exactly. this, this is an ideal 99 PI moment. Yeah. You had like, you had like a physical histogram of like a bar chart of various, <laughs> exactly. like of various heights. That's so funny. I never, I never even thought about that. You could probably do a little study of just of that. And that's, <laughs> so that's there was delightful. a guy standing there and he goes, what did you just take a picture of? And I explained <laughs> that and I watched his eyes glaze over. <laughs> It was like this conversation holds nothing for me. <laughs> Here's you. So you sent me a galley of your book, and I love it. I love it oh, so much. Thank and you. I, thank I will you. tell you, it harks back to my childhood. Um, I did some voiceover work for my dad when I was ten or eleven years old, and my payment was the Book of Lists too. Mm-hmm. Uh, the don't sequel know to the original Book of Lists, and that okay. Book of Lists too defined my early obsessive compulsive brain combing through it learning all sorts of weird shit coming up with crazy facts like that kid from jerry Maguire. and this feels like a very similar book it's the kind of book that you opened up any page and there's something really fascinating going on and then you go back and the structure reveals all sorts of different things about the things you've been reading about Mm -hmm. it's just it's it has very many layers and i'm so glad you guys put this podcast in a book form because it really works Thank you. I mean, the whole the whole conceit of it, you know, a was the fact that Kurt like had the ability and time and drive to do it, which really required like you work with people and, you know, like and we're super busy and it just takes one person who's like, it's book time. You know, like, <laughs> like, OK, yes. we're going to do it now because it wasn't you know, like if I can say it's book time, but until you know, like I need a lot of support to get things done. So that yeah. was one thing. The other thing was like. You know, the show's been going on for 10 years, as you said. It's there's four, I published episode 415, you know, two days ago. And wow. it's like, and there's like so much, you know, like as much as I love audio, I love, I mean, audio is the way I take in the most information. It's the most comforting form of like media for me. Like it's what I love, it's what I love to make. But it's kind of, it's linear and locked up. And it's like, and if you remember, that oh yeah there's that episode yeah. where you talk about fire escapes but you didn't call it fire escapes you called it good egress for some reason and <laughs> um and you know and i i remember that thing and i want to re- 
return to it, but I can't return to it. And it's episode 200 somewhere, whatever. And it was like, it felt like there was all this knowledge and information. And more importantly, like a worldview was kind of locked up in this linear form that you don't necessarily have 20 minutes to do. And so we, we kind of wanted to just explode it out and like, have it available for people to search and to find things and to and we we do this metaphor in the very beginning where we talk about it being a desire path where you can find your way through the information in the in the book and you just there's no desire path in audio you go straight through it yeah. starts when yeah. i tell you to start it stops when i tell you to stop and that's it and and this was sort of this more free form and and to sort of like you know be this evangelist for this um a kind of mindfulness that i think we we infuse into the show that I, I really wanted to just like put it out to more people because as much as podcasts mm-hmm. are the most superior form of, of communication <laughs> and humans, um, uh, there's like, you know, 70% of the world that doesn't know what the hell a podcast is. <laughs> and so, and so I wanted to just reach some more folks and, and it just seemed like the right time, you know? Um, talk a bit. So had you already finished the book effectively by the time the lockdown started or did you have to finish it in that, in that space of time? It was, it was turned in, I think right before, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, because like, especially like in the last few months, like Kurt would come over and we just sit at my kitchen table and edit it and work on it. And that was like in January, that was the big part of that. And then we went back and forth. So it was probably, I think it was like, Mar- I think it was literally March or April that it was wow. like turned in. And then, um, and then what we, so, so that didn't have a huge effect. It affected the, you know, the production of the show, of course. Um, but the, what was, what was really weird in, in regards to the book is that we created this sort of, um, purposely tongue in cheek, generic, you know, like field guide to the city meaning like right. oh you're going to a city here's the field guide to your city you know like <laughs> and it, and and it was supposed to be silly and supposed to be you know kind of applied to where you are but the examples would be from Barcelona or from Syracuse New York or from Bogota and um it was about finding wonder where you are and we had no idea that we would enter a world where you can't go to those places necessarily. And so right. finding wonder where you are is, you know, critical, you know? Um, and so in a way the book is like, it's sort of found this perfect moment in time to exist, you know? Did Mike, you, I, sorry, I, Norm, I just want, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I was just curious because of the, I love the idea of the desire path. When I, when I first learned about that through your podcast and told my wife, She's obsessed with them. And as we walk through Golden Gate Park, she's like, desire path, that's one. <laughs> um, did you work particularly hard on the index also in order to yeah. engender being able to dive in? Okay, so yes. <laughs> in, in the, in the, in the, but the answer is, no, I did not. Um, okay. Like Kurt did. Kurt, yeah. the bibliography in the index, the bibliography in particular is like, it's completely rich. It's like, there's the whole lifetime multiple lifetimes of exploration you can do oh. from the bibliography but it, but the funny thing is about the index is um that's actually was done mostly by the the publisher you know like they they really put together mm-hmm. the index but when we got the um the first proof of it like as a pdf to look at it the first thing that you know kurt and i were like flipping through it and we're of course noticing all the mistakes first and we're you know trying to figure it out we're just like cursing ourselves but we both at some point said you know, the index looks really good. Like we like the look and feel of the index. And it was something we both came to and were kind of delighted by. So yeah, the the index is a huge part of its function. But also the whole thing is like, we spent a ton of time on the the flow of it. We knew that there was a bunch of things to that were existing in, the, in these disparate spaces. And it was all about building a narrative amongst these different parts. And that's always been what the show is. I always said that the, I mean, this only makes sense to math people, but I was always said that the show was this regression plot that we would take, you know, the idea, the thesis of design, and there would be a point here that would be, here's about toothbrushes. Here's about cities. Here's about the design of government, you know, like, and then, and then, and then the thesis of the show was the regression line between all these disparate points. And it all made sense to us that that would be the thing that it was. And the book kind of has, it even has more structure and flow to that, but we always kind of knew that we want it to be a reader book that you could go through straight through and notice the themes and notice how they talk to each other, but also that, you know, they could be disambiguated and you can sort of say like, Oh, I want that thing. I want that thing. And, you know, we were very careful to, 
you know, to, to make them so they, they stood on their own too. The, yeah. the beginning of the essays, um, it, they used to all flow almost directly to one another. Like we'd have a handoff sentence and the editor was like, don't do that. <laughs> she, she, cut, she cut them all <laughs> because she's like, she's like, if they're, if they're reading straight through, they'll get your, their, your connections. And if they're not, this just throws it off. So right. you should just let them be what they are. But it, that was a, it was a funny thing. That's probably the, the type of sentence we cut the most of was this clever little handoff sentence to the next essay. The segues. So, so it could be more, so it could be more desire path, you know, so it yeah. could be more standalone. Yeah. And as a, as a radio person, like, oh my God, I love segues. You like, it's, it's like, it's like my norm, favorite norm thing. Too. <laughs> um, I haven't seen the copy of the book yet. Mine comes next week and I have oh, the coin. Good. Oh, you have the coin. Um, uh, I don't know. Are there, did you, are there illustrations or photos? You guys consciously decide not to to have any, to have that same type of experience where like one of the favorite things I love about listening to your show is that it conjures up the imagery that with the descriptions of it, that, you know, sometimes I Google it afterward or I check the blog right. post and, you know, I, I like the description more than I like the actual thing. Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> and and well, how did so, you put that, you know, into text? So, so a couple of reasons. So one of the other reasons for doing the book was because there are some stories we want to tell with some visuals and it's kind of nice to have them, you know, um, but we knew immediately that it wasn't a book with, it didn't have photographs. It couldn't be, they still had to be abstract and l much like the show is an abstraction of the description of the things we're talking about. So we knew it never could be, uh, you know, like actual pictures of these things. It had to be some kind of representation and finding the right illustrator. And, and we found the perfect one in Patrick Vale um, to, to kind of like take these things and have them uh, be realistic enough to be, you know, demonstrative of the thing we're talking about, but also abstract enough to kind of like, he, he can, he has this really way of like showing tons of detail in one section. And then it kind of fuzzes out into line work, you know, like in the, on the edges. And so it, it, it exists still in this sort of abstract imaginative space. Um, even though it, you see it for the first time. And so, you know, like we, we were really cognizant of what we wanted to do pictures of and what we didn't. And then, and also, you know, he was a collaborator in the sense that we would send him the manuscript and then every once in a while we, you know, we, we'd offer him this sort of like, well, if you think there should be a picture here because you need to picture it or to help you out, um, you know, you should draw it. And so, you know, like when we, when we started getting the, the images back, especially the, like these, there are these huge two page spread chapter images, which are just like, gorgeous i mean they they blow me away the the level of detail and how cool they look and and so you know we we thought about these images a ton i mean we made huge i mean kurt made these huge spreadsheets of like of like okay so here's the essay and this one needs an image and this one doesn't and this one shouldn't have one and all that sort of stuff but it did open up these ideas like one of the things we can't do on the show if something's graphical but not common we can't really cover it on the show you know like i've always there's certain things i'm, I'm kind of obsessed with a certain type of street sign and we've never been able to cover it because you just can't describe it very well is this the merge the, the freeway it's merge, the merge path? One. Oh and my i've God, talked you, to you about this you've mentioned this like back in 2013 exactly <laughs> exactly and so like so so the so like we have like a like a key you know like a key guide to like you know, what the shapes and are of like all the different highway signs in different places are. And that's something that you just can't, you, you can't go, well, this is kind of an escutcheon shield and you can't describe it, you know, like in words, <laughs> but you can look at it. And so, um, and so the book has, it g gives you all this opportunity, but it doesn't sort of take, it doesn't like, I don't think it diminishes that thing that you like, you know, of, of being able to imagine of having it be abstract, of having it be a specific example that, points to a platonic ideal like it still allows it when you when you have the type of illustrations that we've that we've done and i'm trying to think if there's anything that we specifically said like no illustration <laughs> like that, that that would ruin it i can't think of how anyone like that but as as of what I, what i love is the is how they're used and i mean it's just like that's what makes it like a beautiful object to me is the is the drawings in particular and then and then uh, Raphael Gironi, who, who like designed the book and fit it all together is like, is, is like a genius in my, in my opinion, like it's really hard. And I, I know you, I mean, it's like when you're making something, 
the, the, the struggle of making a thing it can overwhelm you to, and it's such that you can't actually see the beauty in the end product sometimes, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I kind of felt that way about the book until it was like sitting across the table from me and I was like looking at it and it was like, and I was able for the first time, like only about two days ago, go like, oh, if I saw that in a store, I would like that book. You know what I mean? But it took me yeah. a long time. You know? you well, there's yourself? that... There's a famous Fellini quote, which I was thinking about last week at the end of a real ass kicker of a build, which is he says, I, he, he used to say, I know one of my films is almost complete when I despise it. <laughs> oh, my, by the end of this book, I was, I was in no mood to talk about the book. And people would say, hey, you want to do another book? And I'm like, there will never be another book. <laughs> and now, and now I I'm had like, the same feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And now I was I'm like, thinking yeah, about it. I was thinking, I'm now thinking about another book. And my wife was like, are you kidding? <laughs> Have you heard yourself talk about what it was like to write the first book? Yeah. Um, yeah. I know that you love not just analysis of stuff, but meta analysis. And I'm curious if diving into this mode of storytelling has yielded any specific new insights into the way you currently tell stories. No, it's a fairly abstract question. Yeah, but. no, I, the process was interesting. I mean, the, what was what was interesting was that it's so, it's so much of a product of both Kurt and my brain, and he is much more of an academic, written writer, and I'm a writer for audio. So I do short sentences. I use second person. I have a sloppy sense of tenses. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, a conversationalist ex- sense ex- of sense. Ex- 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 exactly. To, to put it more generously, <laughs> um, and um, and and so so much of like what we would do is you know he'd write a thing and I would go like I go I don't know could you just say what you why you think this is important you know like and then he'd say it and I'll go like okay so this is what I think is important here and then we talk you talk it through and so you know thinking through um the you know how to be accurate how to be as conversational as you can how to not have it be you know too you know like too cute you know like you can get yeah. you can get away with a little bit more in a, in a in a conversation where you're convincing an emphasis and there's things like that there's like a rhythm that you can get away with there's a rhythm of repeating yourself that's really important in in spoken rhetoric that you yeah. just can't do in books and like to me i read it out loud as a script and i'm like this is genius what are you talking about <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then you know and then he and the editor would say um this is not <laughs> this is not working <laughs> because it's not you reading it. And so, yeah. so it, it changed the way I sort of think about those things to be sure that type of presentation, it really is like it was written from scratch. There are some essays in there that are based off of the research and reporting that we did to be sure, but right. it's really built from the ground up, you know, like, wow. and, and, it, and the whole point, and I think that was the whole point of doing the book is that like, you know, <laughs> people have asked me since the show was at all popular within like two or three years of its existence to do a book. And to me, it was like, I just wanted there to be a real reason to do it. Like not just a reason, you know, not just another product to sell. Like it had to really exist for a reason. And same as video, right? What's that? Same as video. Totally. Totally. Uh, There's been like talk of a 99 PI TV show or video series since its inception. Of course there has. and the, and, and to me, and and someday that might totally happen. Just like someday there was a book, and I, I would nothing... love to help produce such a show. By the way. <laughs> I will hold you to that. <laughs> but like, but my point was like, is that just like the book being so much, it is a book. You know, it is not a translation of the show right. in in this way. It's not transcripts. It's not just retold stories. Like a video series would have to be the same thing. Like, how do you take? the whole like the whole conceit of the show was like i'm going to tell you design stories because you've probably been told design stories that are built around seeing and experience the aesthetics of design and i want you to i want you to take that out of your mind and i'm going to tell you the story of a building before you have a prejudiced sense of how you feel about that building and so 
you can't do that on video. You see things in videos. And so yeah. you have to come up with like a new sort of reason to exist. And maybe the reason to exist is I'm going to subvert your like opinion of this brutalist building and tell you why it's magical or maybe something else. I don't really know. But like as a person who loves design, each thing has to exist in and of itself. Like it has to have a reason to, to live in that yeah. format. And so the book is very much that. The radio show is very much that. The podcast, I guess, is the thing. Maybe and, it's the, yeah. And the, and I'd want the video series to be that yeah. too, if right. it ever exists. Yeah. Um, so uh, the other big shift creatively happened when we all went on lockdown. Would you describe what 99PI's production process was before the lockdown and how you had to change it, which I would imagine would be significantly? Yeah. So we, we um, most of us worked in an office in beautiful downtown Oakland, California, as well <laughs> as well documented. Um, we had a booth there. We had, uh, I had an office. We had people come in. Um, uh, Sean Rial, our composer, she would, um, you know, be composing music in the office behind mine. So I would hear, you know, the percussion, you know, and the oh. piano during the daytime. It made me so happy. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, uh, at the time, you know, Sharif would be mixing next door. I mean, there's all kinds of things. We were just together. And so the lockdown happens and it really was like this slow, you know, we were going to have a, a, a retreat like at, um, it's Berkeley farm. I can't remember the name, but we, we were going to have this retreat like two weeks, like late March, basically wow. March 27th or something like that. And people, we had a couple people remotely. So, so Delaney Hall's my senior producer. She was going to fly in from Santa Fe. Chris Berube is based in Toronto. He was going to fly in from Toronto. And, um, and it was like this slow thing where we're like, should we cancel that? Can, do you think it'll still happen? This was like three weeks before. Yeah. And it was like this weird, it was like a train you see really far in the distance and you can't quite gauge how close it is, you know? Yeah. And, and then all of a sudden it's on you, you know, you know what I mean? And that's what happened when it came to the COVID, the lockdown. And so then we all very quickly just were like, well, we're not going to the office anymore because, you know, we want to be responsible citizens and, and yeah. we were still trying to figure out how to buy toilet paper. Like every, at that point, like <laughs> we didn't know what was going to happen. Like rice and flour were out. I can't believe yeah. that that was so recent that we were like fighting over, you know, the basics of, of staples of life. Okay. So, so, you know, I had a booth, we went in, did stuff, you know, people voiced themselves in the booth, you know, but we always had a remoteness. There was always a capacity to, to work remotely because, um, you know, our senior producer, you know, Delaney Hall was in Santa Fe, for example. Mm -hmm. And then we'd have reporters and reporters are always remote and they, yeah. they track themselves in their closet. There's, when, it comes to, when it comes to like public radio reporting, which is where all of us come from, um, tracking in your closet and working on, by yourself is like, this is how we really <laughs> operate. You know, the like, air you breathe. <laughs> it really is. You know, coming together and having enough money to have an office is is a, a thing that happened only in the last five years, really, you know? So so and, wait a minute. Nobody's done an NPR reporter parody called Tracked in the Closet? <laughs> <laughs> no, but that would be... That, the... <laughs> I'm a little angry about that. <laughs> I think the crossover event for who would get that would be... <laughs> 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 would be pretty narrow but but it's but the the whole but the whole um so so you know it was within you know living memory that yeah. we were all alone um doing it on our own and so it, it it wasn't the sort of sea change that it was probably for like bigger productions for especially sure. for video productions because like you know I'm always amazed like I think when you guys came to my house when Tested came to my house like uh, years and years ago you know um, it's it's pretty minimal it's like Norm and there's like maybe a yep. sound person and then, you know yeah. like it's pretty pretty minimal but like anything above that like I did a thing for you know maybe a, a week or two later with uh, like some kind of uh, some other like uh, video team and there was inexplicably like seven people there, you know, like, and you're like, I don't know what all you do, but there's, you know, clearly everyone's doing a job. And so like, but audio has always been for the most part, one or two, you know what I mean? And so, mm -hmm. and so we, we split, we split apart. Everyone sort of worked from home for a while. And, um, and then slowly, like, you know, like a couple of people go like, it would be, it's really hard for me to work at home. Everyone's at home. Can we use the office? And we have two entrances, entrances in the office two kitchens, two sets of bathrooms and stuff. Oh, wow. And so we could accommodate Sean working in the back and Katie working in the front. 
and have them not interact with each other. And so, so we have two people who work in the office and, and I work at home and, and now it's like, um, Vivian, Vivian Lay, who was up here working on the show. She's from Orange County. She moved back down. Um, I think Kurt's going to be in Minneapolis for a while. Um, one of the people who works in the office is going to move to Colorado, you know, like, and, uh, our newest producer, Christopher is in New York and, you know, we hired him during COVID. And so yeah. I don't think he'll ever move here. And so I think it'll fundamentally change. I don't know if we'll ever come together in an office again in the, in the same way. Honestly. Yeah. Um, uh, we have found it tested a weekly check-in is, do you guys do that? Like a zoom, get, yeah. everyone gets together a few times yeah. here and there. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So yeah. we, you know, we, we have a Monday meeting and, uh, and then we have edits through the week. We have these epic edits for like every story that you hear, like there's at least, uh, two, you know, like three hour group edits that we all just sit in a zoom with. So I'm in zoom all day long. And so, wow. We're, we're still in a lot of contact with each other, but it is not, it's not the same, you know, and, and there's more of an effort to like do a kind of like looser. We have a kind of, uh, Delaney is starting a kind of monthly series. That's a, that's a kind of like, um, to think about longer term projects. So we're not just yeah. solving the immediate projects and we don't have that sort of brainstorm time, you know, like that open time where you think of things for the future yeah. is gone. And so right. she's trying to structural structuralize that. So we have those opportunities too. Yeah. Uh, through the course of the lockdown, my wife is a therapist. And so she does all her therapy online mm -hmm. now. Um, but one of the things I found fascinating was she would report to me like, wow, you know, everyone this week is there, you know, you she'd see these arcs that were really common. Like, yeah. wow, everyone's depressed this week. And I'd see it in the testing meeting. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. I'd see exactly what she was reporting. Like we all had too much and now everyone in the testing meeting is like this and, you know, one day. Totally. I think I, I witnessed that as well. Like we do have these cycles and it, it's, it's really hard. And a lot of it is tied to the news. A lot of it is like, we're really sensitive to it. And then like, you know, it was pretty bad to be in quarantine in general and then I realized being in quarantine and not being able to open your windows, that was a type of misery. Like when the wildfires came, that was a type of misery that I was like, oh my God, I thought this was bad. I had no idea how bad this was. And um, that's actually where me having a shop was such a saving grace because my wife literally didn't leave the house for almost two weeks. Yeah. yeah. And that, all, I mean, she went, went bananas. Yeah, it was, it was, it was really hard. And I'm not like, I'm not super sensitive to outside stimuli, just like as a person, I'm wired a little differently than mm -hmm. other people. And when it gets to me, like, I feel like, oh God, <laughs> like <laughs> people are suffering. You know? like, now, at the same time, we have found that the, the changes we've had to initiate in the production process to accommodate remote working has actually altered the way we're telling these stories in ways that are, that we're still unpacking on an almost weekly basis. And we've, mm -hmm. we've, I've found it really creatively invigorating. I, have you guys found? Yeah, there were moments of this. So like when COVID started, so the first episode I did during lockdown was an episode where I walked around my house and I described things just first person. It was kind of, it was scripted to be extemporaneous. It was not, I like yeah. wrote, I wrote like a script and I put it, I taped it to all the different parts of the house <laughs> I was going to. And, um, and I, and I did a, I did kind of a like, okay, we're going to do a tour of my house and we're going to talk about the weird and cool things of, of the house. And it's going to be like, you know, like the early days of 99 PI and we're just going to do it <laughs> together. And we're going to recognize that this is a moment. Cause at the time, like the, the idea, there was still this idea of like, and I guess there still is now that, uh, self quarantining and 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 isolation was uh, was kind of a radical act of choice. Like you you were you were gonna you were gonna say like no this is the moment. No one's telling me to do it. We're gonna do it now, yeah. and yeah. we're gonna we're gonna beat the people like beat people to the punch of saying we had to do it. And so I was trying to do this, encourage you know, like through example, just go like we're gonna you might be alone. We're gonna just look at the wonder of of my house, and maybe you have some cool things in your house too. And it was just a talk through it, and it was really fun. A because I hadn't done a show completely by myself, you know, in like seven years. You know, right, so it was, right. that in and of itself was kind of fun. And then the subsequent weeks, 
we just like reacted like we wanted to. And so there was like, we did a design of masks. We did it like, how did we get dependent on toilet paper anyway? We, you know, like we, we, you know, like how did we, um, and then this, the, the one that really came together in, in a cool way was a few of us went on this idea of like, okay, so we, the world is going through this natural experiment right now where human activity is going to almost zero. And what does that do to the world? Like, what can you test? What can you check out? What, what can you learn? And that episode was like the culmination of that and, and reacting to that and turning it around within a few weeks or within like, or about a week would normally an, an episode takes us about six to eight weeks to make and maybe even longer wow. to do stories uh, more like in the planet money style where they can, where they can kind of do it in one or two weeks. They react to the news. They do, they do like shows as produced as ours, but they do it in like, <laughs> like a quarter of the time and it drives me crazy. Super annoying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so we were like, well, let's do, let's do a planet money style run where we react to the moment in, in the 99 PI way where we use design as a lens to look at what we're going through right now. And it was really invigorating. Like for a while, it really worked. It got people jazzed. They were, you know, into it. And then you just, we just kind of ran out of steam too. Like yeah, it's yeah. hard to be like that, um, to be that reactive when we're a very, we're very much like a, oh the episode in January of you know at yep. in 2021 at, you know the the um the tenth the episode on the tenth we know what that episode is going to be so th- changing it up like that was both really fun and invigorating and also like we could do it for about four or five weeks and then we were <laughs> we were toast you know <laughs> it was really hard yeah I mean one of the things that we've also noticed is the way that our audience engages with our content is different because they're working from home people are picking up new skills they're we found that over the months you know people are are buying more tools and buying and, and building things where they previously didn't have the space or time to do so and yeah. imagine your audience you know people listen to the podcast differently you know commute the commutes don't happen anymore like what are For you sure. hearing from your audience about how they listen to 99 pi i mean they the- the change in the commute was a big deal for us. I mean, it was like, you know, like wow, I don't yeah. know if it was, I don't know if it was like, it's recovered a little bit, but like we lost a few and, and, uh, you know, in the end, it really, I think it still mattered. Like, I still think we we're feeling like that sort of five to 10% drop because of people not commuting, you know? And, and so hopefully, you know, the, the diehard fans, we find them in other ways and they, they use it at different times, but I'm I'm a type of person like I have my earphones in all the time. And so like if I'm washing the dishes or I'm taking a break or I'm moving from this room to another room, I'm almost always listening to something. Wow. And so, um, and so, but I, I recognize that uh, that's a pathology that other people don't, don't have. I, I'm married to that pathology. My wife <laughs> listens to 10, 15, 20 hours of podcasts a week. I'm exactly the same way. And so, yeah. um, so so those people are still there. Like sort of the diehard fans are still there. I think we, we you know, lose some of the, the people who are just, just looking to fill a commute, you know. And, um, you know, I, 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 I haven't, you know, I think people take it on walks. I think they do a little bit of different patterns. But it, it, as much as there's like this drive, and I think that maybe you're feeling this, like there's some people have extra space in their life or in the beginning. It seemed like they did. People were talking about binge watching TV shows and people were talking about doing projects and break baking bread and all that sort of yeah. stuff. And, um, and, uh, I think all, we didn't quite fit into that category where people had more time for us. They, I think they always had less time for us, but, but <laughs> in general, it's been okay. You know? Yeah. Um, it's, it's fascinating. I, I don't think of the show as a thing that to fill the time, but I definitely think of the ritual it's I, I associate you know listening to your show with how I always you know whether it's a, a long drive to LA I know I'm going to binge this number of episodes and it's, exactly. a, it's, a, it's a relationship in my head and how I process the material and where my headspace is totally and I'm, I'm airplanes. the same way I listened to your podcast on airplanes that was one of my yeah. favorite yeah yeah I'm, I'm I'm and I'm the same way I, I fit different ones in different places like I associate them with different things and 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 uh, in ones that are as dense as mine. Um, as opposed to sort of more conversational shows, they're harder to like, like, you know, click in and click out of, like you really want to listen to the whole thing. And so, you know, I have to be sort of mindful of that sort of thing too. But I mean, so far, like the show has been, it's basically the same. (laughs) It's just, we, we don't know, we can't really react too much to that, to the moment, but it, but we're, you know, but I'm paying attention to it. Like as the, you know, I still like the business owner, I have to pay attention to that sort of thing, you know? Um, 
I remember uh, I got to watch uh, one of Quentin Tarantino's premieres and Quentin was there and he was talking about uh, how he layers in cultural references into his scripts. And he says a lot of it is totally sort of autonomic. You know, he writes a script and only later learns what the script was referring to sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I definitely got that with the book tour of when I wrote my book last year, like going mm -hmm. around and talking for a couple of months about the book actually taught me stuff about it. Um, tell me about what it's like to have a book tour when you're not leaving your house. Are you, you're in the middle of a virtual book tour right now. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a, there was like a ten city U.S. book tour and a three site uh, U.K. tour, and all that stuff was planned, and all that stuff got nixed. And oh. um, and you know, there's there's definitely disappointing parts to that. There's definitely some relief to that too. Like <laughs> just because it, I didn't know how in the world I was going to do the show while I was on the road like that. I just right. you know I just was putting it off in my head. <laughs> yeah. And um, and so you know. So we have each, you know, uh, next week we have kind of like one a day. Um, and they're like these, what, what are these big venues that kind of like sixth and I and, um, Chicago humanities festival and, um, you know, Commonwealth club that are centered on different locations. So there's this idea that it's not completely virtual. Like you're really yeah. traveling across the United States, um, which is ad adorable. <laughs> and, um, and so, and so one of the things we're going to do is, and we've been talking to each of the moderators and, you know, to say like, well, let's do a kind of like, we have plenty of stories in each of these places. So well, let's do a kind of a city specific story at least hmm. to, yeah. you know, to kind of localize it a little bit. And, um, and I, you know, I don't really know. Cause the funny thing about book tours is that, uh, they don't really, you know, we have audiences that are big and they're, you know, they're everywhere. And so, um, it, you know, like all the effort that goes into a book tour, if I put out one more episode, I would reach way more people with one more episode of my show than I would yeah. on any book tour that ever exists in the physical world, you know, but the book tour still feels good, you know, so, so it's, so it's weird to kind of figure out like what the, what is a, it makes you examine what a book tour is for, you know, right. in a way, you know, it's like, okay, so it's a little bit about generating local press. It's a little bit about giving a reason for people to like another touch point to be excited about you or whatever it is. But it's not about like reaching more people because we can, you know, we're, we have the great privilege of turning on a microphone and reaching hundreds of thousands of people, you yeah. know, just, just where we, where we are. So what does it mean to go to a bookstore and talk to a hundred people, for example, yeah. or whatever. And and so it's it, it's been a kind of a process to figure that out, you know, um, and, and I don't know if I know the answer completely, but I'm, I know I'm going to be sitting just like this in front of a Zoom a lot <laughs> next week. <laughs> and and um, and I don't know if it'll feel amazing. I don't know if it'll feel like more like work. I don't know. Yeah. All I know is like when I as much as I, I don't really dread travel, but I, I I'm so busy that it's hard for me to travel. Um when I'm in front of people, I just, there's no better feeling in the world. You feel like a million damn dollars. And so I'm going to miss that. You know, like yeah. I really like talking to people. I really like that moment. I'm not, I'm not a very, I'm a very performatively extroverted person, but naturally introverted person. And so it gives me this opportunity to, to, to do this thing that I love doing. I like hosting. I like making people feel comfortable. I like them making them feel good that they're there to see me. Yeah. And, um, and not having that opportunity is like, is a little, is a little sad, but, sure. but like, but, but by all accounts, I'll reach way more people doing it this way <laughs> than I would otherwise. So, so it's like hard to see what is more important in that situation. I, I don't actually know. Wow. That's fascinating. I, <laughs> I would, I would have really missed it. I really liked going around, traveling around and the book tour kicked my ass. I had just, I, I made a very terrible mistake. I finished, uh, five months of production on a television show and left on the book tour the following week, oh, which God. was idiotic. <laughs> um, and yeah, I was mad at myself. That was no good, but yeah. it, it, it was really invigorating to keep talking about this thing and unpacking it. And I, yeah. I, I look, I look forward to see how the book sort of changes its shape in your mind as you get feedback over the next few weeks. Yeah. I mean, this is what I love about the, you know, like I'm, I'm we're not going to do just straight up presentations. I like the Q and a, aspect of it not just because it's easier <laughs> because people prepare stuff for you but more because like you know like hank and hank green and seth godin and uh 
uh, Kristen Meinzer and and uh, Alexis Madrigal, they will they will find new things for me, you know, to yeah. react to, and right. and that makes me extremely happy, you know, like that that's a that's a fun part of it, and and that's what I loved about like I love Q and As, I love like I love answering things off the top of my head, like everything that totally. we do is so like every script. Every line is edited within an inch of its life. And so it's great to have these moments where you're not edited and it's okay. And everyone is like, they're okay with you making mistakes and they're okay with you stuttering and it's okay. And I just, I miss the live, you know, I, I did live radio for a long time. I, I, it's nice to have that feeling of live radio. And so we'll still have that on the tour and that's a fun part of it, but it, it is really nice to do it in front of people and get dressed up. Like I like to, you know, I wear, I wear a three piece suit. I wear, I have a, I have a pocket square collection. I'm like, I have, I had all these clothes I had bought. I just bought like I, oh. the, the receipt date is like maybe March 10th where I bought all, oh, I went to, I went to, um, uh, Wilkes Bashford and I I decked myself out you know, what I, mean? <laughs> you know like an, and, I didn't know you were a dandy Roman oh I am I'm such a dandy when it comes to being on stage you know and I I had bought all these clothes it was like it was like it was dumb expensive and um but I was like I have events to host I have a, the book tour to yeah. do it's worth it I'm gonna invest in it and do it and I and feel good about myself going out there and they're still at the shop like I haven't had them finally tailored because it's like why why I get them on I just wait to see what weight I am after the end of all this before I get them finished. <laughs> Indeed. Um, well, I think that's a great place to stop. Roman, I, I congratulations on this book. It is a beautiful object. Um, and thank you so much for producing it and 10 years of 99% Invisible. Oh, thank you so much. It's a it's a real pleasure. And I'm gonna I'm I'm calling right after this. We're getting off the phone. We'll stop recording. And then we're gonna talk about the 99 Mi TV show <laughs> that you're gonna produce. Excellent. <laughs> totally. Absolutely. I would love that. <laughs> no, that it's a real a, yeah. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. I, I, I appreciate it. And good luck on the book tour. And good luck with the book. Thanks.